Hey, welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the Daily Show podcast that goes a little deeper into segments and topics that originally aired on The Daily Show. This is what this podcast is like, right? All right, you're pregnant, you're having a baby, you go to have the baby, right? And the doctor be like, surprise, you got a baby. Then the doctor be like, it's another baby in there. It's a little smaller than the first baby, but we think you'll still love it the same. That's pretty much what this podcast is. Today, we've got a topic that was featured in the Dull Saying segment of The Daily Show. This segment is hosted by Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan. In this episode of Dull Saying, she discussed the history of natural black hair. That's right, y'all. They got beauty topics, too. Let's roll the clip. Black hair is like gluten. White people are scared of it, but for some reason, they're obsessed with it. And for most of America's history, white people have done whatever they can to stop black folks from wearing our hair in its natural glory. And our hair has a lot of natural glory. When we lived in the motherland, hair was so important that you could tell a family's name and social status just by their hairstyle. Basically, your hair was how you told all your business. And this is still true today. Show me a black man's waves and I'll tell you if he drives a Benz, or runs after the bus. But when the slave masters came, they cut off our hair as a way to control us and erase who we were. And you know how some people cut off their hair after a bad breakup? It was like that, except they didn't give us blonde highlights. So to walk me through this topic of natural black hair, because I do not have a lot of hair, so I can't be talking about no hair journey. I'm joined by Dulce Sloan and a couple of other producers and writers from The Daily Show. First up, well, first off, Dulce, how are you doing today? I'm well, friend. How is you? How are everybody? Hello, friend. Hello, friend. <laughs> also joining us, Daily Show deep dive producer Chelsea Williamson and Daily Show writer Josh Johnson. Chelsea, Josh, welcome to Beyond the Scenes. How's it going? Um, how you doing? Hey, Roy. <laughs> Well, thank you, Chelsea, for sounding excited about talking no, about black this, women's hair. This, this, this damn misogynist over there. No, mm. this is this is no. how I talk. I I'm, I didn't mean to do anything <laughs> bad. <laughs> Are you excited, Ch Yeah, black women hair. You know, it's this, this, is, this is actually why it's hard for me to find love because no one believes. <laughs> a whole lot you got a whole girlfriend you done been with for four years shut up josh i That's said find i said find but you found <laughs> it found so it. shut up yeah yeah but before that oof Boy. this sounds like a topic for a separate podcast do say before mm -hmm. we get into this conversation about natural hair and everything that goes within that journey first and foremost just break down the term natural hair and what it means to be natural so the term natural hair literally just refers to hair as it how it grows out of black people's heads so just our natural curly hair so hair that's not been processed by chemicals um so it hasn't been relaxed it hasn't been jerry curled it hasn't been s curled ain't nobody put no conk in it but now and i'm just asking as a layman and also a stupid man uh does heat when you apply heat to hair is that still technically natural hair that's just styled natural hair it's styled because with hair that's been straightened, once you wash it, it curls back up again. Okay, gotcha. Now, first off, how long have y'all been natural? Let's just start there. Like, and was there anything in particular that made the two of you just go, you know what? Fuck it. I'm done. Tr I, I would ask you, Josh, but I know sometimes you just put a pick in your hair and let the afro grow. Uh, but Chelsea, we'll start with you. Walk us through the journey to you deciding to go natural. Yeah, so I had kind of reached a point in college where I was getting the relaxers um, and then I was getting my hair straightened every two weeks. And in college, you don't have a lot of money and that is expensive to do. Um, and it just didn't make sense anymore either for me because like my hair is like fine. So like the relaxers and my hair were not jiving very well so i went natural in like 2015 and i transitioned which is like basically i kept the same length of hair for like three-ish years and they were just cutting it the relaxed ends off like over a period of about like three years like i said and they'll say when 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 when, when was your is it called an awakening what's it called when it's you just, decide you know what it's just i want to do something it's different just a decision because it's like so there's two ways to do it i so I have been natural at multiple times, but cause like my mother did my hair cause you know, she went to beauty school and all of that. So 
my mother relaxed my hair and my mother would do my hair. So like in middle school, I just always had braids. So braids are considered like a natural hairstyle. But I remember asking my mother, I was like, mama, should I go natural? She's like, no, you always need a perm. But that was because she didn't think that I would do the work needed to maintain natural hair. But in like 2009, I was like, I'm good with this. Cause like my mama told me like, she stopped. Cause around like 2006, she was like, I'm not gonna be do your hair anymore. And I was like, no one agreed to that. And so I was having to now go to like the Dominicans <laughs> to go get my hair done. And I was like, I'm kind of over this. Cause also it's like, I like like big hair. And so I was like, well, wait a minute. I grow big hair. So, cause I was just tired of just seeing what I look like relax. And I'm just like, well, let's see how this works. So I grew my hair out for a year cause my hair would grow. So I would have to get a relaxer like every eight weeks. Cause I would truly have two different textures of hair mm -hmm. and my hair would not sit down cause it was curls with flat of hair on the end of it. So I grew my hair out for a year. I had like sew-ins, I had braids, I had tree braids, I had all kind of stuff. And then I did what's called the big chop. And so after growing it out for a year, I went to my mom's house and I was like, cut it. I'm like, you're going to cry. Because when she used to trim my ends as a kid, I used to balk and my hair was getting shorter. And she's like, you're going to cry. And I was like, chop it off. Cut it. She cut it all off. She's like, how do you feel? I was like, yay. I felt pretty. Because like I wanted to see what my hair looked like. Because I had done so much work trying to not have, not have my hair on my head like it grows out of my head. So I was excited to see what it looked like and what I looked like as an adult in a styled Afro. Cause I'd never had a styled Afro before. You know, what's interesting about that, you know, as it compares to black men and you can correct me if I'm wrong ladies, but it seems like because women have so many different alterations of yourself that making the decision to go, no, as my hair grows is what I will choose to style and deal with. Josh, were you making decisions because you have a fro now, at what point did racism and discrimination, if at all, play a role in deciding to finally wear a fro or keep you from having a fro for a while? I, I, I think that for the most part, what ended up happening is, is that my hair, I didn't fully understand it. And so I used to, when I lived in Chicago, I would just cut my own hair. I would just shave my own hair. I, I tried to give myself uh, a lineup, but it didn't work. And it looked like the bat symbol. Ooh. It looked like the bat <laughs> symbol every single time. And here's the thing, my natural hair, <laughs> my natural hair looks like the bat symbol. So then people wouldn't even see the work that they actually thought that I made it the ears on purpose and i did it's just that that's how my hair grows so then eventually i was like hey i want to see what my hair looks like something similar to what dual is talking about where i was like let me let me just grow it out because i grew it out in high school and i went to this like obviously you can't call it all white because i was there but i went to a predominantly white catholic school uh and i think that there was something about my hair that i was very proud of especially in my junior senior year that i wore and it was uh, it was so different because not only was I different, but now I had a hairstyle that was very different. And I, as opposed to thinking it would make me insecure or feel weird about it, I was actually very proud of it. And uh, it got to the point where other people thought it was as cool as I thought it was. And I only ended up um, shaving it when I moved to Chicago because I just couldn't take care of it or anything. And then when I grew it out again, this time as an adult, I I faced a, a different set of problems because at first like when i do my hair when i shave it there's the bat symbol which is a problem but then when i when i grow my hair out there are a lot of other problems that begin so you know dulce has been a true angel and friend and helped me out a lot in this journey Ta taught me things that i didn't know uh, that probably i should have known I, I i probably looked like a person undercover tried to get <laughs> black hair secrets from a black woman because because i would ask her things sometimes where she was always she was never this this is the thing this is why dulce is a true friend she never looked at me like so who did you like steal this hair from like like who, like like <laughs> This clearly isn't yeah. your head you're growing it out of for you to be asking me all these questions. So she was always very patient, helpful and everything. And then I think it, it became as I started to do more comedy and um, and get a little bit more known, it became synonymous with me. Like just that 
that extra circle around the circle that is my head. And that that's like how people saw me from far away. That's like how people came to know me. The fact that my hair has changed now, I'm, I'm really finding out who my true friends are because a lot of people don't recognize my face. And we're not talking about a beard situation where no one's seen my face before. My face looks like it looked when I had an Afro. And now I just have these twists that, and people are like, what is it? Yeah, but oh, you got a mask on know? top of that too. You got a mask. You look oh, different. You bad. only look the same in the middle. Rude. My bad. No, I walked. Mm-hmm. I walked into Sounds the racist. cellar. No mask. So <laughs> the comedy club Sounds where racist. you work regularly. Yeah, there were some people who were like, "Hey, we uh, <laughs> what was it? Oh, hey, hey, I'm gonna need to see your vaccination card." And I was like, "Yeah, you've seen it. I'm a, I'm a comic. I'm, I'm here." They're like, "Josh?" I'm like, "Yeah, this isn't a face-off situation. Like, it's still my same head." And so that that now I've, I've I've moved into the twist scenario. I've moved into the because Dulce actually over the uh, holiday did uh did a whole little twist up for me. You know, we we. We, we celebrated the first day of Kwanzaa by mm-hmm. me twisting his hair. Nice. After washing yeah. and deep conditioning. Because mm-hmm. Christmas Day, I detangled his hair. Then he came back over and I washed and deep conditioned and twisted his hair on the first day of Kwanzaa. Why you don't never offer none of that shit for me? I know my hair short. Yeah, you try and give me an edge up or something. I got clippers. Hey, man, I know to do no clippers. If it's a bunch of, and the things that made me the most mad about um, twisting up Josh's hair is Josh has the hair that I wish I had. Like this nigga has so Ooh. much hair. And I'm just sitting there <laughs> doing his hair going, I'll kill you. I was so jealous the entire time I was doing his hair. Like the twist that I had just in the back of his head was the number of twists I get on my whole head. Whole ass hair envy. So, <laughs> So Chelsea, the deep dive department, I've tried to explain it to people that the job of deep dive as a research unit is to go and find the groceries. And then the writers and the correspondents decide what meal to assemble with the groceries that you go and find. So when you made the decision to pitch this Dulce and segment on natural hair, what were some of the things that you discovered that you didn't know about the journey of black women and natural hair? What are some of the things you un- you un you discover, uncover, you know, y'all know what the hell I'm trying to say. <laughs> Shit now. What, <laughs> what were some of the things you uncovered in your research? And then after that, Dulce, I want to hear from you on some of the things you wish could have stayed in the piece. One of the things that I didn't know was how many like legal cases specifically existed, um, especially in like the 80s, like we did go over the Bo Derek tin moment where she wore braids and all of a sudden it was like a craze all over the US. And, you know, there was actually a specific legal case where a black woman then was fired by her employer for wearing braids. And it was because the employer was like, this is trendy. You know, like this, you just saw tin and that's why you did it. And she's like, no, this is a cultural hairstyle. And she lost the case. Um, so wow. I feel like I didn't know like all the details of like the legality, like, um, I wasn't as aware of that. So it was good to learn about that side of things. And then other than that, I think just how far it goes into dress and workplace codes. Like, it's like, you know about it. And, you know, that is the reason that black women um, and black men did not grow out our hair for so many years was because of dress and workplace and societal codes. But just like hearing about like, you know, the military, especially banning black hair, specifically in natural hairstyles and all of that you know it but it's like to actually like read it and see the cases themselves it's it's always a little bit different and so then based on all of that dulce what were the parts that were important to you what were the points that you like they got to know this because we always go into segments like all right we know it's a lot of groceries we can't put everything into the meal but what are the things that had to be in there for you i think the great thing is is like the things that were included in the piece was everything that i wanted to see But I think something that would have been interesting to talk about that we never really talk about is that when I started going natural, a lot of the slick comments that I got were from older black women about me going natural. Like I would just be out and some woman would just walk past me and be like, oh, your hair is nappy. And I'm like, bitch, do you know how long it took me to comb this out, 
I did a twist out. I combed it out. Like, it's like this hair is styled. This hair is done. But we don't talk about how because that hair, our natural hair was seen as unkept and nappy and unprofessional, that permeated through black culture to the point that, you know, we didn't wear our hair natural until like the 70s. And then after the 70s, everybody was relaxed again. And then we did it again in the 90s when the pro-black movement, and then we relaxed again. And then now we've come back to, because after the 90s, we've kind of like been able to like kind of maintain having natural hair. But like in the 80s, you really didn't see, you saw Alfre Woodard maybe on a yeah, TV show. You was a sister soldier immediately if you had it. You was Angela Davis with it off the yeah. top. Um, mm-hmm. Off the rip. Who called you Angela Davis, Josh? No, no one called me Angela Davis. Okay, it wasn't a me thing. I I was gonna make a totally different point. Uh, oh. I, I, but uh, yeah, to what you're saying, I feel like because our hair was seen as this unkempt, or it had to be conformed uh, in a way to make it comfortable for other people, no matter how uncomfortable it was for us. That now you see crazy hairstyles that I actually think are super progressive. I feel like the weekend has done things for black hair that we're never gonna have to go back. Like that, don't you the, dare. The weekend don't has made no, no. The weekend dare. has made such an insane move that the Overton window has shifted so much that now mm-hmm. everything is is dope. Mm-mm. Them locks <laughs> where everybody just looks like a Lego or. <laughs> Palm I don't trees. Know if y'all... Right, the palm trees. <laughs> yeah. like when I first saw yeah. it, it looked like the Play-Doh man or the um the piloncillo, like the that Mexican like the candy, the Spanish candy, where the yeah. tamarind comes yeah. out the, the piloncillo. That's what that looks like. And I was like, oh, so we're just honestly, I'm glad we're free uh to be able to walk out here like Jim Henson characters. But sometimes it's like, okay, sir, you know what? I don't get it. And also there's a lot of things I just don't get. And I'm just like, this isn't for me. You know, this is for the children. I'm glad they're this free, but your dreads look nuts. And that's my only thing where I'm just like, it can be wild, but I just wanted to look right. Like, it's like, but I can say that it's just the person's interpretation. Cause we've all seen certain, like certain sets of locks and been like, that's just the wilderness or people's Afros where you're just like, ah, or sometimes, you know, when Josh would get the sleep box, right? <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Not only did I love my short, when it was short, I actually felt like it looked like a plan because when it was, when it was short, it was like so tight in my sleep, but okay. So for anyone listening that doesn't know what a sleep box is, um, I, when I was initially growing my Afro out, I, so I have night terrors, right? And so I would go to bed and I would do a lot of rolling around because I'm, I'm in my, in my dreams fighting for my life. And when I woke up, I would have essentially a nice, smooth, overpressed look that was completely even. It was like a miracle. It was like completely even. And once my hair got long enough, it no longer looked like a plant or anything. But the beginning of the sleep box was amazing. Listen, we know we were never on board. Um, (laughs) But because the thing is, if he tried to do it, it wouldn't have made sense. But what you needed was those two two good hours on this side. (laughs) And then two good hours on the back. (laughs) And then two more hours on the other side. Ha! And so you just had that pressure kind of lit. <laughs> so it yeah. looks like a box haircut. Uh, and so sometimes we would come in. But, you know, I loved uh, how, because Josh, didn't your mom call you Will I Ain't one day? Look, I've had a lot of hair things happen oh, my in my Lord. life. Okay. <laughs> so th- this is my thing. The reason I bring up the weekend, the reason that I think all this is good stuff is because to me, that's what freedom looks like. Freedom is the freedom to maybe not make the best choices. That's real freedom. <laughs> I mean, that, if that is, and it's like, so the fact that we don't ever talk about how like the things that we say to each other, cause like I knew growing up, I couldn't walk around and be a little girl with the Afro cause aunties would not allow it. Like that hair's not getting pressed. It's not getting relaxed. Like the only time as a little black girl that your hair can be really natural is if your mother's putting it in like barrettes and little braids and stuff like that. Yeah. You were never walking around with an Afro ever. Cause if you're walking around with an Afro, it's like, oh, your mama didn't have time to do your hair. Why are you out here looking like this? After the break, I want to talk a little bit more about that Bo Derek situation and the kind of modern version of it with regards to the Kardashians and 
once you choose to go on a natural hair journey, I need to know how do you learn? Where do you learn? Who teaches you? Who becomes your natural hair Yoda? We'll do that beyond the scenes. Chelsea, you just told us, uh, excuse me, Daily Show Deep Dive producer Chelsea Williamson, uh, you just spoke in the previous break about a black woman who lost a discrimination case with her employer because she had cornrows like Bo Derek, which surely she only did because of Bo Derek. Right. Can we talk about how ridiculous that is? And also, like, wasn't there like more of a present day version of that with the Kardashians? Yeah, I mean, cultural appropriation of black hairstyles is nothing new um, in the least. And I feel like it is something that we've been seeing for years and years and years. And most recently through the Kardashians, like I remember when Kim first started wearing those French braids and they started calling them boxer braids, but actually they were box. It was just like they were taking and making all these new words for these things that like black women specifically have been doing for like hundreds, thousands of years. Hey guys, this is my <laughs> mound of hair. You mean Afro? No, mound of hair. Well, the thing uh -huh. is like, and I'm not always here to defend, cause I mean, I love them. I don't care what nobody says, but the thing that was like, cause I remember as a little girl wanting like the French braids cause our little girl has had French braids. And then my mother kept putting cornrows in my hair. And I was like, two French braids look great. Two cornrows <laughs> does not look cute, yeah. right? Especially, look. It doesn't get the same effect, right? Unless they're gonna be huge. And so, cause like two cornrows is like, this is utilitarian. Like I've got, to, this is, I'm mm -hmm. getting hair out the way. Cause like, I currently have on a wig. My hair isn't two cornrows going underneath it. I only learned how to cornrow decently during lockdown. And it was only to get my hair under a wig because my protective style in the winter time, because winter cold weather is too much for an Afro is a wig. So when I started seeing, cause the reason I started calling boxer braids is because those UFC girls mm -hmm. were wearing them to keep their hair out of their face. Cause I guess a ponytail wasn't enough, right? <laughs> and then all of these white girls started wearing these box, they call them boxer braids. And we were just like, they're just cornrows. And then it became a trend. So the Kardashians started wearing it and they're like, oh my God, it's cultural appropriation. Wait, 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 wait. Why wouldn't we yelling at them UFC girls? Cause they started it. Cause that's where the stupid term came from. Cause if it would have started with the Kardashians, they wouldn't have been called boxer braids. They would have been called like, you know, <laughs> him something else. You see what I'm saying? Like Kris <laughs> Jenner would have coined a term for this. You know, the term came from girls in the UFC. So no one was saying that it was cultural appropriation on that side, but now we're yelling at the Kardashians for doing cultural appropriation. I think the issue was that I don't think any of the UFC fighters knew that they were getting boxer braid. They were just like, just braid your hair so it don't so you don't get knocked out. And then it was called boxer braids by the people, the zeitgeist at large, if you will. So I guess the thing is that the Kardashians, because they've always aligned themselves so close to black culture, anything that they do that dabbles in black culture, I think there is an expectation or a demand from black people that the Kardashians have a knowledge of what it is they're doing. And I think a lot of the time they don't. But when those girls who did UFC, they also grew up in America. So they know what cornrows look like. Because if the option was, they could have just got French braids. Because the only difference between a French braid and a cornrow is how you turn your hands. It's the same technique, except for a cornrow, you pull the hair under the braid. And for a French braid, you pull the hair over the braid. It's the same thing. Because I literally did like a... In a, communication class, in a communication class in college, we had to do a like a speech where we had to like teach how to do something. And that's what I taught was like, this is a cornrow and this is a French braid. And there were black girls and white girls in class like, wait a minute, we've been doing the same thing the whole time. Like basically, but those girls knew they were getting cornrows. So they should have been getting heat too. Everybody should have got, if we mad, we mad. Why are we picking and choosing? The only difference, the only thing I'll say about the picking and choosing is people came for Kim because she cannot fight. 
I think that a lot of people <laughs> wanted to say something to those UFC girls, but they were like, hey, she is covered in blood. She clearly doesn't have, yes. she's not operating at the same level. Like, maybe we got to let this one go. Like, I'm sure, I'm just, a lot of those, a lot of those UFC fighters have partners. And I'm, I'm sure one of the partners wanted to be, there might be, there might be a partner that just knew, saw the whole thing come, was like, Baby, you may want to call them Coros because never mind. You know what? I'm gonna get uh, dinner. Don't tell me what get... to do. I'm a fighter. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and get dinner ready. Uh, don't don't worry about what I said. So Chelsea, to Dulce's point about learning cornrows basically as an essential tool for the creative evolution of her career. What was your journey like in learning how to do different natural hairstyles and maintain? Like, where did you learn? Like, once you make the decision, all right, I'm gonna be natural. Where do most people go to learn how to do that to the maximum? I feel Josh, like Josh, I would I... ask you, Josh, but you go to Dulce's house. So I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> I definitely learned on YouTube University, YouTube which is what it was University. called in 2015. Um, <laughs> YouTube University has been saving niggas. Please yes, know that. I learned on YouTube University and... Um, you know, was just looking up various like natural hair YouTube videos. Like that was like, I want to say the like mid 2010s is like the peak of like natural hair YouTube. Um, so I was just in honestly with like everybody else and all the natural hair blogs. Like, so there was just a lot of ways to kind of figure it out, but I tried everything. Most of it didn't work, honestly. Like I remember when everybody's like, oh, you got to put the oil in the gel and then the, the, and all this stuff that was taking like 20 steps and like I had to go through all of that putting like I remember, you know, or at, at one point putting rice water in your hair was supposed to help. And like, mm -hmm. you know, henna and rice fix everything, rice water, putting henna on your hair, like just all this kind of stuff that like it makes it stronger and it works so well for natural hair. And da, 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 da. I went through all of that. Um, only more recently have I started like following natural hair stylists on Twitter and I've like got down pat like in the past like six to eight months would I say like now I'm like okay I have a generally like three-step rule it's pretty quick and like I don't take all this time because it really used to be a wash day for me and I was tired of it like I was like I I nobody has time for this and now I'm like it's like an hour and a half I'm in and out like because I, I was like I can't do this I think you get to a point though and it's also been taught to a lot of girls because we do you learn from a lot of people from the internet is you think you have to do like these 10 to 20 steps to get your hair to look a certain way. And it's like, you really don't, honestly, for most of us, it's best to keep it simple, but you do have to kind of have that trial and tribulation, like the trial and tribulations of it. I feel like every natural hair girl, like every girl with natural hair has gone through it where you were just at one point doing a bunch of things and it was taking you seven hours to do your hair. <laughs> well, the other thing is, is like one, it's that's why like hair tight started being such a big deal because it's like my mother and I have completely different hair types. Mm -hmm. So my mother's hair is a much looser curl than mine. So my mother's hair grows differently than my hair. Mm -hmm. So I had to, because like when Josh came over and I deep conditioned his hair, I made a conditioner. Cause when I deep conditioned my hair, I make the conditioner. And so like when yeah, Cardi B when, put like during, yeah. When, when so, Dulce was doing it, I thought she was cooking for a second. Like wait, like like yeah. <laughs> some of that conditioner be smelling good, dog. Yeah, that shit had, smells edible. She had the egg and she had the avocado and stuff. I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know it was gonna be breakfast too. This is amazing. I mean, <laughs> it was an egg and avocado and um, olive oil because I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough of my sweet almond oil, and I blend it up. And then if it's I make enough where I'm gonna put it in the fridge, because. This is all, I'll take some of like my uh, regular, like the store-bought deep conditioner because there's like preservatives and chemicals in it. And I'll mix some of that in sometimes if I'm making a big batch so it'll stay in the fridge. Cause if you just put olive oil and egg, you just basically made fancy ass mayonnaise. That's not gonna last a month. So, but it's something it's like the last time I did it, I took like a whole leaf of aloe, blended that bitch up too. Cause like people are like making their own gel. So you have to customize like it based on the texture of the hair is what you're saying. You well, have it's to not like... even just the texture of the hair. It's, you know, my, like Josh has low porosity hair, meaning that Josh's I hair, I, Josh's my hair, hair is uh, ashy. His hair is always dry. My hair is high porosity. So it takes Josh's hair a long time to get wet. Yeah. And then it dries very quickly. My hair gets wet quickly and does and takes longer to dry. 
So yeah, you have to know when you're conditioning. It's like people kept talking about the lock method, the lock method. So it's like mm -hmm. you use like a liquid and then an oil and then a cream. And then I remember going, well, oil seals the hair. So if you're putting a cream on after you seal the hair, then you're just wasting fucking product. It's not so making then, sense. Yeah. It's not making <laughs> sense. And then, every, and I remember, I remember when everybody was putting, I was like, it was like 2016. Everybody was putting coconut oil on everything. Oh, we was girl. Oil pulling. We was putting it on our skin. We was putting it on our hair. And it's like, you had to learn that putting oil on something doesn't moisturize it. Mm -hmm. Putting oil on something makes it oily. So people were putting coconut oil on dry hair and then they just had oily, dry hair. So then we had to go through this whole cycle with coconut oil and then everyone was like, okay, we shouldn't be doing this like this. So it was like, okay, it was moisturizing. It was So there's every couple of years. There's a trend. It's yeah. a trend. But the reason that there's a trend in the way we treat our hair is because for so long, we weren't allowed to wear our hair as it grew out of our head. So we literally lost the connection of how to take care of our hair because for how long, up until like the seventies, they brought us over here at 16, 19, from 16, 19 to the fucking 1970s, we weren't doing our own hair. We were mm. braiding it up and putting it underneath something. You weren't, you know, or like, if you look at like the early 1900s, they were styling their hair to look like European hairstyles. Mm-hmm. So you were still putting heat on it. You know, like you talk like the Marcel iron and hot comb and all that other stuff. We were putting heat on our hair to be able to do hair, European hairstyles and black men, even though they wear their hair, quote unquote, natural, they still had to keep it cut low. Yep. Yep. They had yeah. to keep it cut low. It wasn't, so it wasn't like black men were walking around with big ass afros in 1935. No, they was putting parts in it in the thirties looking like Cab Galloway and shit. Confident. So, <laughs> Cap Calloway with the waves. <laughs> After the break, I want to expand on that point, Dulce, because I want to talk about the responsibility that we have to one another as a black community to foster positive relationships with our natural hair and what the resources are. And we need to talk about the legislation side of this and the Crown Act and exactly what that is. And um, I'm going to tell you about the terrible haircut I almost got in Canada. But we we yeah. don't talk about hairstyles we regret. We this this is beyond the scenes. Yes, Canada. I was up there. Let's talk about the Crown Act. Let's talk about the legal side of change on this issue with black hair. And then let's talk about what we could be doing as a black peoples in the community. Chelsea, uh, break down <laughs> the Crown Act for us. Yeah, so the Crown Act was founded and it stands for um, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, um, if I'm not mistaken. And it basically was created to fight these legal battles and to try and make sure- Sidebar, I'm sorry, them letters mean something? Yeah. I just thought it meant it's to an talk acronym. It. It's an acronym. Oh, That's why uh, it be in all uppercase. That's why it's in all caps, yeah. Oh, I thought y'all was just always typing it wrong. Anyway, continue on. <laughs> all right. We did our research. No, Shit. No problem. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's created to fight against these um, discriminatory like practices and codes that are existing in laws and in workplaces and dress codes. Um, and I think it's been legalized in quite a few states, but not every state. It's legal to like wear your natural hair as is, which is crazy to say out loud, but is true. Um, so that's what the Crown Act is seeking to do. It's like seeking to actually go and make sure that natural hair is legal in every single state because that should be a no brainer. The only time that that seems like a bad idea to me is when I see these football players with the long, wrong locks. Yes. Cause I was watching some football game and I saw a lock on the field. Oh yeah. Oh, no. They <laughs> deliberately target your locks and then will take it off the field like a trophy, like the predator. Because they said it's not a part of, cause like grabbing mm. the locks isn't included like grabbing the uniform, right? Yeah, it's it's all part of your physical being. I can legally grab that. If you're a football player, wouldn't you tuck your locks into the back of the- uh... No, because then how would you not know I'm a bad motherfucker that when I got locks. the ball? Yeah. Oh, oh I see. Some of them do for 15 tuck years. Yeah, some of them do it. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Some of them that don't want a bald spot, they do it, but- yeah. Oh yeah, you're gonna leave with a plug. <laughs> Right, <laughs> they ain't gonna have a plug. But do they make the guys with just like long hair? Do they make them tuck their hair like Detroit Pomalu used to tuck his hair? 
I feel like Palomalu. Yeah. I Palomalu, feel like sorry. his. I feel like his hair flowed from under his helmet. Like that's how he won yeah, the few NFL like players was... with a with a shampoo commercial. <laughs> right. <laughs> he had a Head and Shoulders ad <laughs> for a while. <laughs> that's some gorgeous men, though. Wait, mm, is he Tongan Samoan? Yeah, yeah he's somewhere Pacific over Islander. there. I ain't yeah. gonna guess. I ain't trying to get canceled. He from over there. Listen, I you make know? a people with one of them. I make some humans with that. I ain't got a problem with that right there. <laughs> so we can legislate some level of acceptance, but what are things that we could be doing as a people to create more acceptance within our community when it comes to supporting people on the natural hair journey? Are we not supporting? I mean, embrace I... everything that you see, because I feel like this is what's happening. When you're white, you can have, like, literally the same hair as somebody else minus one thing and it's a whole different hairstyle there's no there's no way to wear white hair that is not considered a style like you, you can't like even if it is unkept there's still like that's where grunge came from like there's no mm. situation with white people where they're doing something wrong with their hair they may be doing something that's like unkempt to someone else but everything is a style and i think that we still have like a little bit of of um of ways to go when it comes to like there are the ways our hair grows naturally so a lot of people naturally lock up a lot of people naturally get afros everything but then there are some things where i think that kind of to what dulce was saying before there is like some self-policing in there where it's like well why can't he have like you know a sort of like s curl to the side or what like whatever goofy thing it looks like because then the same way that fashion works, that'll like give rise to a thing that's actually cool one day. Like it'll inspire because I something think, else. But I think it's because we have been taught that we have to be presentable. And I don't know if it's just all black yeah. people or just Southern black mm -hmm. people, but we have, when you step out the house, also we are flashy ass people. We are flashy ass, get dressed. Like, like, I remember being in Vegas and we were going to a show and the only people that were dressed up to go to, cause like, these are like, you know, Vegas shows, like big ass Vegas shows at these hotels and stuff. These white folks out here in cargo pants and Margaritaville t-shirts, black folks was dressed. There might've only been a few of us there, but we go, we when we go out, we go out. Yeah. You can't, even the most hood ass dude, his sneakers are still clean. You see what I'm saying? So for us to get past the self-policing, we would also have to get past the fact that like, yo, if you don't come out the house looking a certain way, even if you have no money, you still come out the house looking decent. You see what I'm saying? Changing that because definition of look, decent within our people. Right, because mm -hmm. you still have to come out the house looking presentable because you already have to deal with all of the racism and all the other stuff. No matter how many degrees you have, if you a nigga in a Benz, you a nigga in a Benz. It don't matter. You're still a target. So the mindset is, if I'm going to be a target, I got to look good. So it's like, why? Are you, so I think sometimes I'll see certain people be like, yo, why are you going, if you out here with your head looking like this and your clothes is a little unkept, you're inviting the cops to fuck with you. And I think that's how sometimes we think because even if you out here looking nice, the cops are still gonna fuck with you. But see, what I love now about us as a people, they'll say, to that point, if I can piggyback and extrapolate on your point. Mm, to that point, what I love is that in the 90s in Alabama, the perception would have been, why he out here looking any kind of way? You, you ain't got no good hair, you need to brush your head. Whereas now, I could see a black person with locks, with dreads, with the afro that they ain't quite figured out what they wanna do with yet and just respect that they on the journey. It's almost in the same way the hoodie has become this accepted, it, it, you, you didn't wanna look like a certain type of person if you wear this. Where now mm -hmm. it's like, no, this is what I wear, I'm proud to wear it and I want you to respect and accept me no matter what I'm doing on my body, be it hair or clothes. Chelsea, how much does, what what role do retailers play? Cause, it, it, cause y'all know my girl, y'all know my partner, Salone. And Salone like meets with other women with natural hair just on the street. Like they just see each other and just, you got natural hair, I got natural hair. Where you get your natural hair stuff? Yes. And it's like a conversation, yeah. like it's like buying weed in 1982. It, <laughs> <laughs> How much of a responsibility do retailers play in getting more hair care products and creating more shelf space for this style of hair that's becoming more prevalent? 
I think they're a big part. I also think that a lot of them need to stop having an ethnic hair care line like aisle. Um, there's still a lot where it's literally <laughs> called the ethnic hair care aisle. The black and aisle. It's like just put it in the hair care section and we will know. Here's <laughs> your section, Negro. Here's your section. I love that. I love it. I don't want to get confused by Pantene and all this other goofy shit. Have my shit over here. Go I go, okay, fuck that. You can segregate that. I don't have time to be fucking, uh-uh. I don't be going through Garnier Frutrices, all that suave shit. No, put my shit over here where I know my hair going to get moisturized instead of me getting tricked by bottles looking alike. And now all of a sudden, I got baby shit. I got Johnson & Johnson in my fucking house. Keep my... You can keep my shit separate. Chelsea, I'll, excuse, I'll, excuse separate but equal over there. Go, go ahead. And I understand what all. you're saying. I do understand what you're saying, though, Dulce. And I also don't mind. Ha- Maybe if you have it in a specific section, that's fine. But I just don't think that needs to be called the ethnic section. Like, I think if we look at it. Yeah, it does not need a name. If yeah. we look at it and I see Cantu and Shea Moisture, I know where I'm at. You know? Right. Um, so I would say, like, that's a big thing. And then also, a lot of these companies need to be a lot more wary about what they're putting into these black hair care products because hair care products in general have a lot of chemicals, but especially black ones because they were made for, like, a lot of them used to be made for people with relaxers. So they had to have a lot of stuff in them um, that may not have been very good. I think that could also be um, improved. And then, yeah, also just depending on the different textures. Like, I think you need to carry stuff that's for all textures of curly hair, um, not just for women with looser curl textures and just so everybody is being included. All I know, if one more white person comes up to me talking about diva curl, I'm going to jail. Do they try yeah. to touch your hair? Are, are white people still trying no. to touch black women's hair in 2022? Or has I mean, the memo been spread? Such, no, people are still trying to touch women um, in any year, in any decade. No, it's... White people all of a sudden are now wearing their curly, I guess it's trickled down to them. Yeah, no, and it has. It has. Now they're not straightening their hair like they used to. And I don't know whose company Diva Curl is. I've never met any black woman who has any type of four texture that uses it. I don't even know anybody with three that uses it. You know, they're like, yeah, Diva Curl. And I'm like, I don't use this shit. I'm not, I have 4C hair. We're not, we don't have the same needs. You're still having to strip oil from your hair. I don't need, there's no, there. I have nothing to strip. I'm just trying to cleanse and moisturize. So now they're starting to triple down. So now there are, you know, non-black people of color and white people with curly hair that are now, like Shea Moisture got in trouble a while back. Chelsea, you remember this? Yeah. Folks was mad because they had a commercial and it was some curly hair redhead girl in the commercial, and I think the main thing was that was the first commercial yeah, mm-hmm. that Shea Moisture was going to put on TV, and it was a curly-haired white girl in it. And black women were like, yo, we've been on board with y'all since day one, and y'all do y'all's first commercial, mm-hmm. and it's a white girl in it? Yeah, yep. What the yeah, hell yeah. are you talking about? And they ended, I think they ended up pulling the commercial or something. The store that I always carried the most natural, like, black hair products for me that wasn't the beauty supply store was Walmart. Mm -hmm. I was about to say Walgreens. Yeah. 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 Walmart had it. And then Target all of a sudden started. Because like before you had to go hunt down Carol's daughter. You had to go hunt down Shea Moisture. You had to go hunt down to Leah Wajid. Weed in the 80s. Right. And so now it's I can roll in Target and go and get these products. And so there has to be a thing where it's like we have to talk about, you know, we have different textures of hair and different textures of hair have different needs. Cause like I can tell on with, if there's a black girl on TV, that girl finna be loose. <laughs> yep. Loose. Oh, we don't even yep. have time to even get into that. Cause the more natural hair styles you see on television helps to normalize natural hair. But then that means that you have to hire people who know how to do natural hair so that you can get the right hair care for the actors and the actresses on set who have yeah. natural hair. Lord, this lady tried to cut my hair the wrong direction one time on the show. We don't even have time. The wrong direction? She, I, <laughs> oh, I no. cut my hair to the front. She took them clippers and went to the back like I was getting enlisted in the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> So to close out the show, let's stay right there in that pocket. Everybody, one by one, give me your worst hairstyle you ever had. Hairstyle you thought was the shit. And you look back on it and go, I should not have done that. Josh Johnson. It's fitting that I go first, I guess. Uh, so... <laughs> 
Wow, what an attack. What a because <laughs> you, you said all of it like you were ready, right? Like just your worst hairstyle that you thought was popping in was a Josh Johnson. Like it was it was all one breath, one Josh, sentence. Josh, I know you got six or seven in the clip. Go on, give us one. Bless us. Well, I'll I'll give you one that was not my fault. So I got a haircut from a guy that while he was cutting by hair, his fiance broke up with him. And so then he still tried to finish the cut emotional like stressed out everything no. then, at, then, at, then at one point he like tries no. to call her so he's like can i can i just say i was like hey do what you got to do and then he calls her doesn't win her back on the phone call so now i just he has so the now rest he's of my worse head. now he's worse now he has the rest of my head to do and then i get i get on the bus and i know i don't look good because he didn't offer me the mirror he was just like he he was just he just finished and then was like I Pippin like uh I appreciate you coming through appreciate you understand and everything but like he's still like so upset that he's not in the world and so then uh I leave and there was there was someone who genuinely walked up to me on the bus it was when I was in Chicago walked up to me on the bus and was like uh are you are you all right like do you do you have somewhere to go <laughs> and I was like, like you were homeless a hundred percent a hundred percent and they gave me a, a one love as they got off the bus and I was like wow okay this is the probably the worst haircut that I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life it was Goodness like you, you know what it you know what the only thing I can compare it to is uh it's actually dual say this is why I was so stressed out about getting haircuts was this this exactly but it was the close that i can think to it is in the commercial roy you might remember this in the commercial for the video game i think it was ray to rumble where one of the guys like the black guy with the afro yeah. guy hit really hard and a piece of his afro came out it was like that boom it over piece of my bro ah! chelsea give us a legacy hairstyle that you look back on with regret. I'm, I'm gonna guess, I feel like you had finger waves at some point. No, I never had finger waves, but the first time and only time I ever did twists on like when I was transitioning, but pretty much natural, I got them done in a salon. I don't know what, well, my hair is fine and thin. Let me say that, because fine and thin girl, girls will understand. Um, my hair is not made to be twisted like that. I looked like an ostrich. Like I sent a photo to my father and he was literally like, you look like an ostrich <laughs> because it was just like all these oh, curls that were just no. sticking out. And it looks like like single curl, like it looks so bad. I literally had to go home and wash my hair and do it all over again. <laughs> Dulce, I'm gonna guess yours. I'm gonna say Queen Latifah, mother of Egypt, high top fade. Okay, my mother would never permitted me to have a high top fade. Um, what I can say is that in like uh, the early 90s, I lived in Miami. We moved back to Miami. And the trend at the time in Miami was to make every little girl look like a grown ass woman. So I remember being in PE and me and other little black girls, they were like, we're playing flag football. We're like, uh uh, these finger waves gotta last all week, coach. And so no. I have finger waves in Miami. I have French rolls. So you basically had every hairstyle from the movie Baps with Halle Berry. Not that bad, but because <laughs> I would have, I would tell you, I look like a, I was 10 years old, nine, 10 years old, and I look like a young executive. That's what I would tell you. <laughs> I had, I'm talking about, so basically some of the hairstyles from like the movie uh, Boomerang. So, so TLC. <laughs> Right, so I had the finger waves that went to a French roll. Like, I looked like I was running HR when really I was just learning how to divide. <laughs> it's really what I was doing. But the thing that I hated the most, because I loved all of them hairstyles, but my mama, so when uh, Lady of Rage came out, so it was like 94, I guess, like the Afro Puffs was, you know, she came out with a reference stuff with her Afro Puffs, but my hair was relaxed. But my mama wanted me to have Afro Puffs. So what she did is she gelled my hair up in the big, two big ponytails and then got uh, the two-tone black and burgundy weave and gave me Afro puffs, like the curly black and burgundy hair. Cause burgundy hair was really big. Burgundy and platinum blonde was real big at the time and gave me burgundy and black, big Afro puffs. And I absolutely, I, I hated it. 
Burgundy and blue. She an Atlanta Falcons fan? Oh, my goodness. That was the hair. Because in Miami at the time, it was you had like a two-tone where it was like black that faded into burgundy. The kids call it like a balayage or ombre now, but the shit was two-tone hair. It started black, went burgundy, or it was blonde. And since I was a little girl, they were like, she can wear burgundy, but she can't wear blonde. Josh, Dulce's mama gave her a Fast and Furious paint job. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. First of all, what will not be allowed? Wow. Respectfully, respectfully. Respect. Okay, L- listen. This was Miami's in the early '90s. They was putting acrylic on people's toes. You understand? It was a colorful time. <laughs> it was a colorful time. My worst haircut is the one I ended up not getting. I was doing a show in Calgary, and Calgary, for the people who don't know, that's a part of Canada that's very Wyoming, Montana esque in terms of what it feels like and the black population up there. And I was there, it was the last day of shows, and I had an audition in LA the next morning. Like, as soon as I land, I gotta get straight to the audition. So I knew there wouldn't be enough time to get a haircut in LA. So I figured, well, let me just roll the dice and see if I can get a haircut here in Calgary. And I I asked one of the other comedians, hey, where's it? He goes, but there's a barber shop. He didn't say, this spot does black hair. He, he just said, there's a barber shop. And it was in a mall. That was strike one. Oh. You, I don't know any black person get their hair cut across from a Forever 21. But it was nope. there. And I walk in. And as soon as I walk in, there's two white barbers. And God bless them. They both looked up at me. And they just go, we can't do it. And like for a split second, I thought it was racism. But they was like. <laughs> I'm happy to try, but I don't know if you will be happy with what the results will be. Mm. I can't do it. I go, didn't you have to learn it to do this job? He goes, yeah, you learn it, but you're only as good as your last cut, mate. And I can tell you that it's been some years. I said, I appreciate the honesty. (laughs) It's been some years. It's been some years. Hey, I I ain't cut black hair in a while. Now, I assume you coming in here, he can see the desperation in my face. He knew I was, we both know what the fuck it is. Right. So I just ended up going to uh, Walgreens and buying some clippers and just having to hatch it myself up in the mirror. I ended up not getting the role, if you're wondering. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what the worst feeling is, getting on set and seeing a black woman that can't do my hair. And that has happened a lot. Getting on set and she being like, sis, and I'm looking at her being like, I can see the vision. You don't need to be touching me anyway. So yeah, Lily coming to set, having my own hair care products with me doing my own hair because there's a lot of for the same way that that barber had not cut black hair because doing your own hair and doing somebody else's hair is totally different but there are black hairdressers in the entertainment industry that because of how the industry is have only really worked on white people Whew. now that's something we gonna unpack for the next dual saying but that's all the time we have for today hopefully we've taken you beyond the scenes Thank you so much to Dulce Sloan, wonderful correspondent, Daily Show deep dive producer Chelsea Williamson, and of course, the wonderful Daily Show writer, Emmy-nominated writer Josh Johnson. Thank y'all so much for going beyond the scenes with me.